Well, thank you for inviting me into your home or office. This is Pastor Steve Altai with Park Street Christian Church in El Dorado Springs, Missouri. And our Sunday morning message for the 8th of December, 2024. We're working our way through a four-part series entitled Christmas Carols, where we're taking a look at some of the iconic, most widely accepted and used Christmas carols from over the years and the story behind them as um, interpreted by scripture. <clears throat> so again, this is part two of four of our series on Christmas carols. And today's uh, uh, Christmas carol that we're diving into is O Little Town of Bethlehem. And the subtitle to the message is Thank God for Little Things. We're going to be looking at Micah 5 2, Luke 2, and 1 Corinthians 1 primarily. Micah 5 2. Luke chapter 2 and 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you for this opportunity. I just pray that you'll use this to your glory and for your kingdom's sake in all ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Phillips Brooks was burned out. He was known as the most dynamic and inspirational preacher of his time, but he had lost his fervor and he couldn't seem to recover. Only in his mid-twenties, Brooks had become pastor of the Holy Trinity Church in Philadelphia. He then persuaded a super salesman named Lewis Redner to be his Sunday school superintendent and organist for the church. Well, the church exploded in growth. They began with 30 children and within a year, there was over a 1,000 children alone in Sunday school. And the next two years, the numbers increased partly because of Brooks' dynamic preaching, partly because of Redner's moving music. But then came the Civil War, and the mood of the church turned somber. Women were wearing black, mourning the loss of sons and husbands. Darkness fell over every facet of the worship services, and Brooks tried to be inspirational and encourage his church, but it was absolutely draining him. Then the war ended, and he thought that the vitality and joy would return immediately, but it did not. Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, and the pain intensified. Phillips Brooks was not the president's pastor, but because he was such a great order, he was asked to preach the president's funeral. He reached down deep and found the appropriate words for the moment. But later, he was so burned out that he just couldn't seem to rekindle his own spiritual flame. Phillips Brooks then asked the church for a sabbatical, and he took a trip to the Holy Land. On Christmas Eve afternoon in Jerusalem, he and several others mounted horses and took off riding. It was a wonderful, life-changing afternoon for him. He prayed, spent time alone with God, and at dusk, when the first stars came out, he rode into the tiny village of Bethlehem. The town had changed very little since the birth of Jesus, but it, it lifted Brooks' spirits to be there within a few feet of where uh, Jesus was actually born. There was singing in the church of the nativity, and he felt surrounded by the Spirit of God. And he wrote this in his diary, and I quote, Again and again, it seemed as if I could hear voices I know well telling each other of the Savior's birth. Before dark, we rode out of town to the field where they say the shepherds saw the angel. As we passed, shepherds were still keeping watch over their flocks. Somewhere in those very fields we rode through where the shepherds must have been. End of quote. It grew increasingly dark, and Brooks sat up on the hillside looking back at the flickering lights of the small village of Bethlehem. And there was a wonderful stirring within. He later told friends that the experience was so overpowering that he would forever be, there would forever be singing in his soul. A few late weeks later, when he returned from his sabbatical, he had a renewed vigor. But when he tried to explain his experience to the congregation, they couldn't, he couldn't express it even though he was a great orator. Three years later, leading up to the holidays, he reflected on that, outside, that evening outside of Bethlehem and decided not to write it in prose but poetry. And a simple poem came easily to mind. After he wrote it down, he shared it with Louis Redner. 
And when the organist read the words, O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. He somehow knew the power of what Brooks had experienced in the Holy Land, and he knew that he had to compose a tune that fit that poem. But no matter how hard he tried, nothing came that suited him. Lewis Redner went to bed on Christmas Eve feeling that he had failed. But that night, a simple tune, tune came to mind while he was lying in bed. He got up and wiped the sweet sleep from his eyes and discovered that the words of the poem fit perfectly in the tune. In the tune. As if directed by God himself on Christmas morning, 1868, O Little Town of Bethlehem was complete. And it became a Christmas favorite in Philadelphia. And by the time of Phillips Brooks' death in 1893, it had become one of the best-loved Christmas carols in the world. This song of a dedicated Christian in search of spiritual renewal touches, continues to touch lives today. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. I want you to see, first of all, today that God chose a little town in which the Savior was to be born. Now, Bethlehem was not impressive, not at all. It was kind of a small suburb of Bethlehem. Its population was estimated to have been only about 150 people. There were no important crossroads there, no notable resources there. Bethlehem was a quiet shepherding community noted for two things. Number one, it was the birthplace of Israel's greatest king in the past, King David. And secondly, it was prophesied that it would be the birthplace of the coming Messiah who would inherit David's throne. 700 years prior to the birth of Christ, the prophet Micah wrote in Micah 5.2, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origin are from old, from ancient times. So the coming ruler would be born in Bethlehem, but that would not be his origin. He was to be a visitor from ancient times. The Messiah was to be from everlasting to everlasting. And one day, God sent the angel Gabriel to visit a woman named Mary who lived in Nazareth, about 75 miles north of Bethlehem. She, he informed Mary that she had been chosen to be the mother of the Messiah. Now, the, angel, the Bible says that angels desire to look into spiritual matters. And so, the angels didn't fully understand the mystery of God's redemptive plan until it was unfolding. And so Gabriel must have been puzzled. Perhaps he thought, you know what, the Messiah is supposed to be born in Bethlehem. I wonder how that piece of the puzzle is going to fit. And so Gabriel may have watched for six months, seven months, eight months, wondering when and why Joseph and Mary would travel to Bethlehem. But they remain in Nazareth. Eight and one half months later, they still had no plans to go to Bethlehem. It wasn't likely now that Mary would travel given her condition. But Luke writes in Luke 2, verse 1, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Isn't that typical? Caesar was about to levy a new tax. Politicians are always coming up with a, with a clever new way to raise money. Several years ago, I received a letter from the government saying I had overpaid my self-employment taxes and included with the letter was a refund check for $365.44. I was pleased, naturally. But only about three weeks later, I received a second letter saying that they had miscalculated and I had not overpaid at all. And so now I owed them the $365 dollars and 44 cents back plus 27 dollars and 87 cents in interest plus an 18 dollar and 27 cents penalty fee for a total of 411 dollars and 58 cents now it didn't seem fair i was willing to pay back what they had gave, given me the 365 and change but i was not excited about adding the penalty and the interest for their mistake what could i do 
Well, I did the same thing that you would do. I paid it. It cost too much to fight it. There wasn't much I could do except for gripe about it in a sermon illustration. The king is always looking for new ways to raise revenues. And Mary and Joseph were probably exasperated beyond measure about the inconvenience and expense of now going to Bethlehem. Why would Caesar be so insensitive to the needs of people? Well, Proverbs 21, verse 1 says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He directs it like a water course, whatever he pleases. And so Caesar thought he was cleverly raising taxes, but really God was using him to help fulfill prophecy. And Luke 2, verses 3 through 7 reads, And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And kind of a parenthetical comment, Gabriel perhaps knew now and was again impressed with the wisdom of foreknowledge of God. While they were there, Luke continues, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths, placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. There is an old saying, big doors turn on little hinges. God often selects small places to do big things. A famous cartoon used to be printed in newspapers around the country of Abraham Lincoln's on Abraham Lincoln's birthday. It showed two Kentucky farmers talking over a rail fence. One asked, anything new going on? The other responded, nope, nothing new. Oh, they say that Nancy Lincoln gave birth to a baby boy last night in her cabin, but nothing really important ever happens around here. But who would have guessed that perhaps America's most loved and respected president would be born in Hodgenville, Kentucky. A little spot in the road. Who would have guessed that anything significant would ever happen at a little spot called Cane Ridge, Kentucky? A little crossroads a few miles outside of Paris, Kentucky. Cane Ridge was the site of a gigantic revival that was kind of initiated by Martin W. Stone, a Presbyterian minister back in the early 1800s. That revival, which lasted for weeks and weeks and weeks, was wel and welcomed as many as 30,000 people from across Kentucky, over an eighth of the population of the state at that time, was the impetus for a spiritual awakening that brought people together from various denominational backgrounds, and they concluded that it was time to abandon diversive denominational creeds and to allow the Bible to be their only guide to be called Christians only. And in time, the movement of Martin W. Stone at Cane Ridge joined with a similar movement of Tam Thomas Campbell at Brush Run, Virginia, and the Christian Church, Churches of Christ, became the fastest growing religious movement on the frontier by far. Um, Sheila and I have had the privilege to visit that spot twice. That little spot called Cane Ridge, Kentucky. Because God chooses the weak things of the world to shame the strong. And you can visit that spot and you can see around the neighboring gentle slopes, hillsides, many trees. And it's easy to see how there was various preachers because of the, the diverse crowd and the crowds um, assembled in a large area around there. In fact, they were there for so long that the government brought in food and water for, for many of the people. But they ride by horseback and by uh, buggy and wagon and stayed and stayed soaking up the Word of God by the power of the Spirit of God. And there were sometimes various preachers preaching at the same time, different spots right around that location, standing on stumps as a podium, or literally up in trees, straddle of large branches and preaching from there. Um, but God used that in a phenomenal way. That had to be a thing of God. Let me tell you about the little town of <coughs> Tyro, Kansas. Population less than 500. A little crossroad in south central Kansas. A preacher graduated from Ozark Bible College many years ago and went there as a young man in his first ministry, I believe, 
and started preaching a little white framed wooden church building but that church grew and people uh, because of the sparse population gravitated there to attend church and get involved in church for something like 40 miles one way and that church ran uh, between 900 and 1,000 people in attendance in a town of, of less than 500. And over the years, it sent literally dozens of young people have went off to various Bible colleges to be trained to go into ministry. That's one of the strong results of that, uh, very impactful results of that, that church in a little spot in the road, Tyrell, Kansas. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come from me one who will be ruler over Israel. God chose a little town in which the Savior was born. But God chose a little town and also a peasant couple. For Christ is born of Mary, the Christmas carol goes, all gathered all above, while mortals sleep with angels keep their watch of wondering love. Jesus' parents were not impressive people by any stretch of imagination in the world's eyes. Mary was a young woman who was special in God's eyes, but the elite of Judea didn't know her. She was from Nazareth, which was a small village of less than 300 people, but it did not have a good reputation. Um, it was a no place as far as the world was concerned. Joseph was a carpenter. That was a noble occupation, but carpenters were blue-collar workers who usually lived hand-to-mouth, project to project. Mary and Joseph were so poor that when it came to offer sacrifice for their newborn child, they offered up not a lamb as normal, but two young doves, which according to Leviticus 5.7 was the offering of the very poor. And I wonder if Mary would have had a reputation good enough that you would even have hired her to babysit your kids or your grandkids. And yet God entrusted to his young son, to this young, inexperienced, but godly peasant couple, and Christ was born of Mary. It's no wonder that Phillips Brooks suggested that perhaps gathered all above while mortals sleep, the angels keep their watch of wondering love. But see, God often chooses people the world labels as insignificant to do his will or people who are completely out of character for the position that God puts them in. David was just an overlooked shepherd boy when Samuel anointed him as king, passing over several apparently more better qualified uh, people. Gideon was just a timid farmer who called, was called by God to be general in the army. And when Jesus chose his closest disciples, he did not choose the wealthiest or the most creative operators or the best promoters or the most educated legal experts. Jesus chose fishermen, tax collectors, and the unskilled, ordinary men. But with those 12 guy, dedicated men, he influenced the world. Now, there are exceptions. Sometimes God selects super talented, well-educated, brilliant people like the Apostle Paul or C.S. Lewis or... Chuck Colson, and they do extraordinary things. But often the Lord has to do with ordinary people like Mary and Joseph, most likely like you and me. God uses unimpressive people to do dynamic things. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26 and 27 reads, Brothers, think not of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were, uh, think of what you were when you were called, he writes. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many by, were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. And that's true in every walk of life. God often raises up people from very unimpressive backgrounds to do his will. Many years ago, the U.S. News and World Report magazine carried a for feature entitled Ike's Dark Days, How an Unlikely Leader Taught an Unprepared Army to Fight. General Dwight D. Eisenhower, the man who became the Allied commander and led the D-Day invasion and eventually became President of the United States, had a very unimpressive beginning. The article said that Eisenhower was the third son of a failed Midwestern merchant turned creamery worker. 
Ike chose a military career because West Point offered a free education. After an indifferent cadetship where he graduated in the middle of his class, he embarked on a very undistinguished career as a staff officer, kind of stalled out at the middling rank of major for about 16 years. Later, his first visit to the White House came and the people there misspelled and mispronounced his name. The White House log on February 9, 1942, recorded the initial visit to the Oval Office of P.D. Eisenhower, and Eisenhower is spelled I, uh, E-I-S-E-N-H-A-U-R-E-R, not like it's correctly spelled. Well, in spite of all that, he was commissioned to lead the English-American invasion of North Africa, but that was initially a disaster. The Americans were driven back 85 miles in a week, and U.S. casualties exceeded 6,000 men. And Eisenhower was humiliated. And those were dark days for him. But he studied his mistakes, and his leadership ripened to a season. Eventually, God used this most unlikely man, a lieutenant colonel, who'd never even commanded a, even a platoon in combat, to become a four-star general and lead the Allied forces in the defeat of the, Nazi, the evils of Nazism. And the British brass was dumbfounded about Ike, and even George S. Patton said that the DD in Eisenhower's first two names actually must have stood for divine destiny. Every day I have the opportunity during the school year to teach at El Dorado Christian School and there are sitting in those classrooms a number of young people whom pretty much none are noticing. They don't have the best grades, most of them the most talent, uh, many not the most striking appearance. But something will happen to some of them along the way and God will tap them on the shoulder at a critical moment in history and they'll be used to take the gospel to the masses or to feed the hungry or to comfort the hurting or perhaps to discover a cure for a hated disease and the world will once again be amazed at the grace and the power of God. Daniel chapter 4 verse 17 says God chooses some people and I quote so that the living may know that the most high is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets them over the, the lowliest of men. God chose a small town where the Messiah to be born. He chose a peasant couple to bring him into the world. But I think maybe most amazingly, he chose to enter the world as a helpless infant. The song continues, How silently, how silently, the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. When God gave his only son, there was almost no indication about how valuable this gift was. He came to earth silently, humbly, as a helpless baby. Ron Davis said, sometimes the most delightful gifts come wrapped in the simplest packages like, like swaddling clothes. Ken Dyer, in his book, Intimate Moments with the Savior, writes, and I quote, Deity nursing from a young maiden's breast. Could anything be more puzzling or more profound? The divine word reduced to a few unintelligible sounds. And then for the first time, his eyes fix on his mother's deity, straining to focus. The light of the world squinting. Tears pool in Mary's eyes. She touches his tiny hand, and the hands that once sculpted mountain ranges cling to her finger. End of quote. There's a Christmas song that asks, Mary, did you know that your baby boy was Lord of all creation? Mary, did you know that when you touch the face of your tiny boy, you touch the face of God? Well, there was no way she fully knew, and no one else even came close to guessing how valuable this gift really was. Ken Geyer continues, and I quote, And so, with barely a ripple of notice, God stepped into the warm lake of humanity, without protocol and without pretension. Where you would have expected angels, there were only flies. 
where you would expect as heads of state, there were only donkeys. Yes, there were angels announcing the Savior's arrival, but only to abandon blue-collar shepherds. And yes, a magnificent star shone in the sky to mark his birthplace, but only three foreigners bothered to look up and follow it. Thus, in the little town of Bethlehem, that one silent night, the royal birth of God's son tiptoed quietly by as the world slept. End of quote. But why? Why did God choose to send Jesus into the world as a helpless baby? He was God. He could have come in a tremendous display of power. Wouldn't it have been impressive if he would have arrived as a seven-foot giant accompanied by armies and a host of angels? Well, I can think of three reasons why Jesus came as a helpless baby. And the first is he came not just to save us, but to identify with our painful struggles. Jesus came not just to save us, but to identify with our painful struggles. Someone imagined Judgment Day and the people from all walks of life standing in line waiting to be evaluated by the Almighty. And some of them began to mumble, Who is God to judge us anyway? He lives here in this perfect, protected environment. He doesn't know what we went through. And so they formed a committee and developed a series of accusations against God. If he was going to judge them fairly, he would need to experience some of the horrible abuses they knew on earth. One survivor of the Holocaust said, let him be born to a despised race. A homeless man insisted, let him grow up in poverty. A grief-stricken teenager whined, let one of his parents die and leave him to weep night after night. A man who grew up in a broken home cried, let the legitimacy of his parents be questioned and then let him grow up in a single-parent home. A blue-collar worker said, let him have to work with his hands to make a living. A divorcee complained, let him be betrayed by someone he really loves. A prisoner of war bitterly suggested, let him be tortured and taunted by enemies who hate him. And a terminally ill patient sneered, let him know that he's going to die and then have to struggle for every breath. And so one by one, they brought their accusations, and the crowd cheered in agreement after each one. But after they were all read, the audience grew silent because they realized God had already served his sentence. In one act of becoming completely human, Jesus identified fully with our pain. And no one can legitimately say, God does not understand, or God is not qualified to judge me. Hebrews 4.15 says, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet was without sin. So Jesus came not just to save us, but also to identify with our painful struggles. Secondly, Jesus came as an infant to demonstrate his awesome power. The Lord later told the Apostle Paul, My power is made perfect in weakness, in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. You know, we are more impressed with a coach who is able to win a championship with ordinary players than one who wins with a lot of superstars on his team. God uses the simple things to confound the wise. He uses the weak things, in view of the world, to humble the strong. R.C. Spruill wrote a Christmas devotional once called Big King, Little King. Here is a very abbreviated version, and I quote, Once upon a time in the tiny land of Palestine, two kings were alive at the same time and at the same place. One of the kings was about 70 years old. The other king was an infant. The big king was evil. The little king was pure. The big king was rich and powerful. The little king was stricken with poverty. The big king lived in the opulent palace. The little king lived in the stable. The big king's name was Herod, and he was called Herod the Great. The little king was named Jesus, and he was called a servant. The big king died and is now remembered as a little king. The little king grew up, became Jesus, the king of all kings, and the lord of all lords. End of quote. 
And then the third reason why Jesus came as a baby was to illustrate how God normally works in our lives today. Now, we often think that God is going to work dramatically, supernaturally, and sometimes he does, and certainly he can. But normally he works in quiet, patient ways, almost silently in our lives. We, sometimes we don't even know he's working. When the prophet Elijah was looking for God, he did not find him in a violent wind or the terrible earthquake or the destructive fire. But God came to Elijah in a very still, small voice. Elijah heard God in a whisper. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming. But in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. More lyrics from O Little Town of Bethlehem. Charlene Ann Bombix loves Christmas and normally makes everyone else more excited about it too. But a few years ago, she wrote that she had trouble getting into the Christmas spirit because she was facing a serious operation just after the holidays and trying to get her mind off her upcoming operation. She decided to visit a mall and get her picture taken with Santa as kind of a humorous gift to her as husband and two grown sons. One afternoon at a new nearby mall, she came across an unoccupied Santa and asked if she could sit next to him to have their picture made. He seemed pleased by the idea, and so Charlene squeezed in next to him for a photo. And then the congenial Mr. Claus turned to Charlene and with a twinkle in his eye, asked what she wanted for Christmas. And without giving her, time, her brain time to engage, she blurted out, Santa, I'm having an operation next Wednesday, and I'd sure like a quick recovery. And for a moment, she was mortified that she'd spilled her problems to a complete stranger. But Santa looked deep into her eyes and said, I'll pray for you, and so will Mrs. Claus. Charlene, moved with sincerity, started to cry. Those words were just exactly what she needed to hear. So often, it's not the big things that matter most in our lives. It's the little things. Just someone saying, I'm praying for you, and you know they mean it. Or just a tiny word of encouragement scribbled on the bottom of a Christmas card. Someone baking a cake or cookies for a neighbor that's seldom seen. A phone call to a relative who doesn't expect to hear from you. It's the little things that make Christmas special, like Christmas traditions, as reading Luke 2 to your family or singing happy birthday to Jesus with your children or grandchildren, attending Christmas Eve service with your family together. Phillips Brooks, who wrote this song, once said, It's while we are is while you are patiently tolling at the little task of life that the meaning and shape of the great whole of life dawns on you. And so let me challenge you today. If you are looking for God in a melodramatic appearance, a spectacular miracle, although he could do it, you're probably going to miss him. He could do that, but he doesn't usually overwhelm. He normally comes in quiet, unassuming ways. He came to such a little town to just a peasant couple with a helpless baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And today, if he's whispering your name or gently tapping you on the shoulder, please don't miss him. Today, if you would hear his voice, please do not harden your heart. His ways are not your ways, but they are so much better. His ways lead to forgiveness, meaning, peace, and eternal life. Let's pray. O little town of Bethlehem, O little child of Bethlehem, descend on us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. O come to us, abide with us, our Lord, Emmanuel. And I close once again um, asking you if we're not personally acquainted, I'd be glad to help you with any need that I possibly can if you're searching for the truth about Christ and 
to this point have not accepted him, yielded to him, surrendered to him as your Lord and Savior. Or if you have, but you're someplace looking for a good church home, either way, would you text me at area code 660-342-3068 and explain who you are and your situation a little bit. I'll respond. I give you my word. Perhaps we can then email and maybe talk on the phone. And I'll be glad to send you resources and make connections with you the best I possibly can to help you with whatever your spiritual need is. But I hope this Christmas season, or any time, you'll be willing to really open yourself up to the truth of God's Word. Whether you can comprehend it all right now or even believe it all right now, just yield to a little bit to the one who can radically change your life for the better and give you His best, now and for eternity's sake. That's my desire for you. That's my Christmas wish for you this day. God bless you.